Good morning, church. It's so wonderful to be with you this morning. Our call to worship is found in Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is good. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are the people, we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Join with us as we continue in worship this morning. Good morning, and now let us begin with a time of worship. solid gold like a vow that is tested like a covenant of old your love is enduring through the winter rain and beyond the horizon with mercy for today faithful you have been and faithful you will be you pledge yourself to me your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips.
remains, we shall remain. I will rejoice and I will declare, God is my victory and he is here. This is my prayer in the harvest, when favor and providence flow. I know seed I've received I will sow Let's pray together Lord we lift your name up high and we echo the praise of David who said that you Lord are exalted as head over all you are the ruler of all things Lord in your hands our power and strength to exalt and give strength to all. So we pray, God, for strength and healing for those now sick, comfort for those who are grieving because of their loss, Lord. We pray for protection for those who are providing care during this time, whether they be doctors, nurses, and others who are dedicated to service. We pray for provision for families who are struggling financially, Lord. We pray that you provide direction and wisdom to our leaders and that you make haste the end of this deadly virus. We pray, Lord, for the pastor today and the message asking that you speak through him with words that will move us to applying it to our lives. So Father, we raise these praise to you as a faithful and loving God. We give you thanks and praise your holy name. Amen, amen. FBC family. Uh, Hi, everyone. This is Tony Oyakasas, and this is my wife, Melissa. 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 Um, we wanted to reach out to you uh, to uh, let you know a little bit about how we're handling things during this pandemic uh, for story time. Um, but first, we wanted to extend our well wishes to everybody in the church community, and we hope that you're doing well, staying safe and healthy. And um, I know that things seem a little bit stressful these days, but I pray that you're making the best of, of everything um, during this time. So um, Melissa's going to share a little bit about how she's handling uh, COVID-19 uh, during this pandemic, and then I'll, I'll share some thoughts. But of course, I'll defer to Melissa first. Yes. So um, as many of you know, I am a registered nurse in New York City, and um, I do currently work in Brooklyn at a small community hospital. It is a public city hospital. Woodhall Medical Center um, in a very underserved part of Brooklyn. So um, the most of the patient population is Hispanic, African American, and um, min minority po populations. And they really are underserved, especially in that part of Brooklyn. And um, it's a it's a very special hospital in that sense because it really does feel like a family, and the staff there really do care and love for the patients. Myself, I care and love for our patients so much. And it really is a very tight knit community there. And a lot of the patients are related. A lot of the patients know each other. And it really just has this um, special, genuine feel. And it's hard to explain unless you work there. But um, I'm just trying to convey that. For time's sake, I'll, I'll you know, speed it up. So um, I do work in, um, normally my position is in the medicine clinic so it's an ambulatory care um, division of the hospital so it's outpatient and we mainly focus on preventative health primary care getting people referrals and things that they need and um, getting people education for chronic diseases and things like that now given the nature of this pandemic most preventative health and primary care outpatient um, locations have transition to virtual care and telehealth. So with that, myself and some of my colleagues volunteered to um, be redeployed inpatient. And um, we felt, especially I felt that I would be more of a resource and would be able to contribute more um, and help people more on the inpatient setting on the front lines during this uh, crisis. So about the last week of March is when I transitioned to the inpatient setting and I've been there about a month 
And um, at first I thought I knew what I was getting myself into, but I really didn't. But all throughout the process, um, the Lord has really just strengthened me and given me this peace I've had in my um, heart and my um, soul. And there's been a, a number of moments that have been extremely humbling for me. And um, there's many times when I'm alone in a patient's room and I'm there with them and nobody else is there. They can't have their family there. You, we try to limit who goes into the room. So we limit exposure even on the front lines. And um, it's just really the only um, comfort and solace that I can find in those moments are when I just remember, um, you know, the Lord is with me and the verse in the Bible where it says, um, whatever you do the, to the least of these, you do unto me. So whether um, it's the wealthiest person in the world or it's the poorest person in the world, I'm caring for them and I do it unto the Lord. And that's what I've tried to always do for my whole career. And I tried to even do that now throughout this pandemic, when it can even be scary for a nurse to go in a patient's room. You know, it, you can kind of have that moment where you think twice before you step in, like, do I have everything I need? And I try to just protect myself as much as I can and be as careful as I can. And I know um, Tony has some stuff to share, so I'll let him take over. Yeah. So um, honestly, my story more comes from the, my point of view as the spouse of a healthcare worker. You know, I'm stuck here working from home every day, uh, teaching um, my classes on Mondays, you know, every week. So I, I handle the monotony of my day like any probably any anybody else does. But in addition to that, I have the notion of thinking about Melissa constantly. My you know knowing that my wife is out there in PPE, where there's already a shortage of PPE out there, um, going battling each and every day, coming home, sharing war stories, horrible tragic stories of people suffering, um, knowing that this is repeated every single day practically. It just as as a spouse, it just it just makes me uh, take pause and think about how I know that in spite of all the calamity going out there in the world, and in spite of all the struggle that I know Melissa is going through emotionally, physically, and psychologically, I know that at the end of the day, you know there is a light at the end of the tunnel, and I know that God is right behind her every single way, and I pray for Melissa every morning. For protection and peace but uh, there's a verse in particular that I have used as sort of the structure for helping me pray for Melissa each and every day and it comes from Jer Jeremiah 17 verses 7 to 8 which says but blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord whose confidence is in him they will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream it does not fear when heat comes its leaves are always green it has no worries in a year of drought and never fa fails to bear fruit so that's my prayer for Melissa. I, I know that she's very much appreciated. She's my superhero. Everybody who knows me knows I love my Marvel comic books and Batman, of course. But Melissa is my superhero these days. I'm rooting for her. I'm praying for her each and every day. And I know that a lot of you are praying for her as well. And we covet those prayers. We thank you so much for thinking of her, especially as she's going out there. Uh, we thank all of our essential workers who are doing the, the selfless task of going to work. We thank all our other medical personnel within the church community. And more importantly, we're praying for everybody who is suffering from COVID-19 or who has recovered. We're thinking of you. We're praying for you. We're thinking of the entire church community. I know that things are very rough these days, like I said, but um, I do, Melissa and I do both look forward to the day when we can come back to FBC and worship with all of you and where there is a moment of, of peace as opposed to panic. And uh, I know that we have really tried to instill that faith over fear mentality, and I hope that you all try to do the same as well. So anyway, thank you for your time this morning. We thank you for listening to our story. And uh, again, we're praying for all of you, and um, uh, may God, may God uh, reign supreme throughout this whole pandemic. Anyway, take care, everybody. Thank you. Good morning. Today's scripture reading is found in Mark chapter 5, verse 21 to 43. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. 
please come and put your hands on her so that she would be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman who was there had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. And instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. And the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, Don't be afraid just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. First Baptist Church, how are we? Time is an interesting thing. Objectively, we all know that the units of measurement for time are constant. One second is always the same amount of time as the next second. One minute is always the same length as the next minute. One hour, one year, one decade, one century, so on and so forth. But subjectively, we also know that our perception of that very same unit of time can vary greatly. If you've ever done a plank, you'll know what I mean. Planking, for those of you who are not familiar, is that core exercise where you're in the upright push-up position. One minute of planking feels like one hour of anything else. The only other thing that can uh, rival uh, a minute of planking is one minute of waiting for the microwave to finish. Now, my point is that not all time is created equal. Some moments pass by us like the blink of an eye, while other moments may feel interminable. It's why older parents will often tell younger parents, cherish these years when your kids are young, because you'll never get them back. Parenthood is that special time, as they say, where the days are long, but the years are short. Joy has this way of making time fly by. And on the other hand, pain has the opposite effect. It just seems to keep going on and on while the moments cannot move faster. In our passage today, the unit of time we'll be dealing with is a period of 12 years. 12 years. 12 years have passed since the birth of Jairus' daughter, Jairus the synagogue ruler. And I have no doubt that those were 12 years that must have flown by. Those are 12 good years. 12 years of joy. And just as the life of Jairus' daughter began, we also see that in the life of the other main character in our passage, the woman with the bleeding, life has essentially ended. At least life as she had known. The 12 years for her must have been 12 long years of pain. 12 years of waiting for healing that must have felt like 12 lifetimes. Now today, as we explore together these two stories that have become intertwined, we uh, see that first, this is a story about waiting. It highlights how the Lord uses the pain of waiting for our good. Second, 
This is a story about faith, a story about how the Lord honors faith regardless of our status or position in life. And finally, this is a story about the touch of Jesus, a story about how the touch of Jesus brings life and wholeness for us all. Let's pray, and then we'll jump right in. Father, today we echo the words of Samuel as we pray. Please speak, Lord, for we, your servants, are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. First, this is a story about waiting. Jesus returns to the western shores of the Sea of Galilee in what is presumably the um, city of Capernaum. And as soon as he steps onto dry land, he is mobbed by throngs of people. Now, in the midst of the crowds is Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Now, a synagogue ruler is a layperson who has the leadership role within the synagogue. It would be a lot like one of our leaders of the church, like a deacon or a trustee. Jairus is a godly man. Jairus is a person who is held in high esteem. Jairus is well-respected by his community. And yet, Jairus casts aside all dignity as he makes his way to Jesus and falls down at Jesus' feet. He pleads with Jesus, verse 23, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. Jairus loves his daughter. I have no doubts about that. How do I know? Dignified leaders of the community don't grovel. And yet, Jairus casts off all reservations when he approaches Jesus. But there's more than that. You can tell the kind of relationship a person has with an individual by the way they refer to that person. Notice how Jairus calls his daughter, my little daughter. His daughter is 12 years old. Now, for those of us who have forgotten what a 12-year-old looks like, let me remind you. They are not little. My son, CJ, is 12 years old. He's my height, and he is eating me out of house and home. The most common words that come out of his mouth are, are you going to eat that? We lovingly call him hungry CJ around the house. But Jairus calls his 12-year-old daughter little. Not because her size is little, but because of the place that she has in his heart, because of his affection for her. In his eyes, she will always be daddy's little girl. And Jairus knows that the only hope for his little girl is Jesus. Jairus has personally seen the miracle-working power of Jesus. He knows that healing is in his hands. And if only she could receive that touch of Jesus, she would be healed. If only he could get Jesus to get to his little girl in time, then she would live. And remarkably, Jesus agrees to go with him. However, there was a problem. There were so many people surrounding Jesus, pressing in on Jesus, that it was hard to even wiggle through. Would they get there in time? For Jairus to have to wait uh, as they slowly made their way through the crowds must have been excruciatingly painful. Maybe for you, there's a similar feeling. Maybe you've been waiting for Jesus to do something that will turn your life around. Maybe you're waiting on the Lord to end this pandemic so that life might resume. My guess is all of us are waiting for that. Maybe for you, though, you even wonder why things are moving so slowly, if at all. Maybe you've even asked the Lord, please hurry. If that's you, let me lovingly remind you That much like Jairus, this is just the beginning of the story. God's not done with your story yet. If you find yourself frustrated with the situation that you are stuck in, it's not because the Lord has forgotten you. Maybe it's just because you're in the middle of your story. In your waiting, you just need to keep on walking. Keep on walking with Jesus, just like Jairus did. In our waiting, Jesus is present. Jesus walks with us through our pain. Let's never forget that the Lord may not come when we want him to, but he is always on time. Tim Keller says this, Be aware that when you go to Jesus for help, you will both give to and get from him far more than you bargained for. 
be patient because the deal doesn't work out the way you expected. When we look back on our lives, what many of us will come to find is that the straightest path sometimes is actually a zigzag. Seasons of life will feel like a long and winding road. We don't understand the detours that we take. We might not even see the purpose behind them. But know this. God is with you in the detours. God is with you in the delays. God is with you in your pain. God is with you as you wait. I'm reminded by how uh, one of my good friends was on this long drive. He was strapped for time. He was rushing to get to where he was going. And as he rushed to get to his destination, it was also snowing. It just so happened that as he was driving and it was snowing, he was out of windshield wiper fluid. You know how how the windshield gets real grimy when it's snowing and and that snow mixes with salt and and, and you're, you're dry and you're just trying to wipe it and it's just starting to smear? Now, without any windshield wiper fluid, it became really hard to see. So he decided maybe he could pour some coffee on his windshield. And that was a big mistake. It just made things worse. Now he couldn't see, but it was in sepia tone, right? So reluctantly, he had to pull over at the highway rest stop. He was mad because of the delay and the lost time. He was rushed. But then when he got back on the road, uh, he realized just how fortunate he was to have stopped. Because those cars that he had been driving alongside just minutes ago had gotten into a massive pileup, a huge accident. Now, if he hadn't stopped, he could have been one of those casualties. And when he told me the story, he saw it as the Lord's protection over his life. At the moment, he didn't know that, but in hindsight, it became obvious. The Lord's hand was on him. Maybe for you, feeling like you're at a standstill now is frustrating. But know this, in your waiting, the Lord walks with you. And more than that, your story is not done yet. Now, not only is this a story about waiting, it is also a story about faith. As the story continues, the woman with the bleeding enters the scene. In the same way that Jairus is now waiting for healing, the past 12 years for this woman has been nothing but waiting. All the doctors uh, and all those visits have dried up her finances, but her bleeding continued. When would she get better? Would she ever get better? She hears about this miracle worker named Jesus. She says to herself that if I can only grasp at the hem of his garment, then I will be healed. There's certainly some level of superstition as you look at this surrounding her beliefs, but she wasn't focused on any of that. She just wanted to get well. She knew very little, but she acted in faith on what she knew. And that's all it took. Now, the gospel writer, Mark, doesn't condemn her for her imperfect faith. In fact, one commentator says, Mark relates that she does the one and only thing for a disciple to do. She heard, she came, she touched. She responded in faith to the very little that she knew about Christ. She heard, she came, and she experienced, though, the saving power of Jesus. The moment she touched the hem of the garment, her bleeding immediately stopped, and she knew that she had been healed. Mission accomplished, right? It was her plan to touch Jesus and be healed. She probably never thought much beyond that, but after she had been healed, she hoped that she could anonymously just step back as one of the nameless faces in the crowds, fade into the background, and slowly piece her life back together again. But Jesus doesn't allow that to happen. Jesus stops, and in verse 30, he said, Who touched my clothes? Verse 31, it says, You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, Who touched me? In other words, when Jesus asked, Who touched me? His disciples answered, Uh, everybody? Now, it may seem to you that the disciples are being less than respectful here, but bear in mind that they're keenly aware of the urgency of getting to Jairus' house in time in order to heal Jairus' daughter. In their eyes, there was not a moment to spare. To them, it was clear what was important, and Jesus needed to focus. But Jesus has a bigger picture in view. 
Jairus' daughter will be made well in due time. After all, Jesus is the one who created the heavens and the earth, the one who holds eternity in his hands. So what difference would it be if he was healing a sick girl or bringing her back to life? Nothing is impossible for him. But at that moment, though, he needed to bring life transformation to this woman who suffered for so long. The woman had wanted to be cured of bleeding, but Jesus wanted more for her. In those days, menstrual bleeding was not only a health issue, it was also an issue of identity, an issue of belonging. According to the Levitical law, those who had menstrual bleeding would be unclean for the duration of their period and cut off from the community. But because this woman never stopped bleeding in those 12 years, what that meant was she was completely cut off from the people. She had become ostracized, and she no longer had a place in society, no longer had a place in any sort of life. Now Jesus insists on drawing her out, not to shame her, but to actually remove all shame, to turn the encounter from wanting something, in her case, a cure, into a personal encounter with someone, Jesus himself. As one person said, the desire for healing and wholeness is ultimately the desire for Jesus. James Edwards says this, in the kingdom of God, miracle leads to meeting. Discipleship is not simply getting our needs met. It is being in the presence of Jesus, being known by him and following him. In verse 33, it says, Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. The woman comes uh, clean by telling the whole truth. And here she's met not with condemnation or criticism, but with care and compassion. Jesus says in verse 34, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Be freed from your suffering. With a word, Jesus restores her to fullness of life, full acceptance back into the community. Now, this is an amazing story that illustrates how faith works. Now, in our economy, those with power, those with position are the ones who make things happen. But for God, God is no respecter of persons. In God's economy, he doesn't care if you are a pillar of the community like Jairus was or the pariah people avoided like this woman was. What matters is how we respond when we hear the message of the good news of Jesus Christ, that we will respond in faith by drawing near to reach out and to touch him, believing in him. Faith means acting when the moment of decision comes. Let me say that one more time. Faith means acting when the moment of decision comes. In his book, uh, Wild Goose Chase, Mark Batterson tells this story about faith. He says, quote, In my experience, signs follow decisions. The way you overcome spiritual inertia and produce spiritual momentum is by making tough decisions. And the tougher the decision, the more potential momentum it will produce. The primary uh, reason most of us don't see God moving is simply because we aren't moving. If you want to see God move, you need to make a move. He says, I learned this lesson in dramatic fashion during the first year at National Community Church. We had been praying for a drummer to join our worship team for months, but I felt like I needed to put some feet on my faith. So I went out and bought a $400 drum set. It was a field of dreams moment. If you buy it, they will come. I bought the drum set on a Thursday. Our first drummer showed up the next Sunday. He was good. He was actually part of the United States Marine Drum and Bugle Corps. Rock and roll. He says, I cannot promise that signs will follow your faith in three minutes or three hours or three days. But when you take a step of faith, signs will follow. God will sanctify your expectations and you will begin to live a life with holy anticipation. You won't be able to wait to see what God is going to do next. Signs follow faith. This woman stepped out in faith and saw her life transformed. How might the Lord be prompting you to step out in faith today? What ways in which you can actually act on this? This story is a story of waiting. This story is a story about faith. And finally, this story is a story about the touch of Jesus. 
as Jesus uh, brought life transformation, as Jesus brought this full restoration to the woman, news arrives that Jairus' daughter had died. With good intention, the people try to be helpful. They tell Jairus not to bother the teacher anymore. Instead, maybe he should uh, concentrate and begin his mourning in, in place of that. At that moment, it must have been hard to ignore the fact that if Jesus had not delayed, he might have gotten to his daughter in time. Maybe she would have been healed. I think we can all relate to that in some way. It's easy to play the game of what if with God. But verse 36 happens. Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. The word for overhearing uh, uh, gives a sense that Jesus here heard it but ignores it. So Jesus ignores those voices that just said all those things about leaving the teacher alone. And instead, he focuses in on Jairus and he says, have faith, believe. Seeing what uh, Jesus had done up to this point, Jairus mustered up what feeble faith he has. And Jairus does believe. They go and they arrive home and the mourners are wailing. Verse 39, Jesus went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. And the people laugh in a mocking tone. These are professional mourners who are often hired to bring the right kind of atmosphere for the occasion. If anyone could tell the difference between death and sleep, it was them. But it's super interesting to me how Jesus uses sleep in situations like these. He uses the same word sleep to describe Lazarus' death. It seems that with Jesus, sleep describes a temporary physical state. It's nothing that a good resurrection can't fix. On the other hand, you can be dead while you're still alive in Jesus' eyes. Because when it's evident that there's a spiritual absence of life in Christ, you already are dead while you live. As we go back to our passage, Jesus brings along Peter, James, and John, and Jairus and his wife to where Jairus' daughter lied on her bed. Everyone else is asked to leave. They're kicked out. Verse 41. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. With a touch and with a word, Jesus brings to life this little girl. The words he speaks are not an, a magic incantation. Rather, this is a gentle word of love. The words are in Aramaic, which Mark translates. Talitha, the word uh, that gets translated as little girl, is actually most literally uh, translated little lamb. This is a pet name. This is a term of endearment. Parents love giving their children pet names. All my kids had pet names. My daughter Grace, uh, has uh, her Chinese name is uh, Bo Ju, which means precious pearl. So growing up, we would call her Bobo, Bobo, until it became uh, too embarrassing to say it in public. CJ's name in Chinese sounds like little lion, so we would call him CJ Jai, which means little lion in Chinese. Noah was uh, really fat as a baby, so we would call him Meatball. And for this little sweetie, Jesus called her Talitha. Now, kum means arise, get up. It doesn't mean resurrect. It's simply get up, wake up. It's what you might say to a child to wake up in the morning. Talitha kum. Sweetie, it's time to get up. Tenderly, Jesus bids her to wake with a touch and with a word. Tim Keller again says, Jesus is doing exactly what this child's parents might do on a sunny morning. He sits down, takes her hand, and says, Honey, it's time to get up. And she does. Jesus is facing death, the most implacable, inexorable enemy of the human race, and such is his power that he holds this child by the hand and gently lifts her right up through it. Honey, get up. Jesus is saying, uh, by his actions, if I have you by the hand, death itself is nothing but sleep. This is the power of the touch of Jesus. There's a professor of psychology uh, and scientific advisor for 
uh, Pixar's film Inside Out. His name is Dr. Keltner. He claims that human touch is the, quote, foundations of human relationships. He explains, skin to skin, parent to child, touch is the social language of our social life. The foundation of all human relationship is touch. There are four years of touch exchange between mother and baby. In this social realm, our social awareness is profoundly tactile. Keltner was one of the co-authors for a study that looked at celebratory touches of uh, pro basketball players, including fist bumps, high fives, chest bumps, leaping, uh, shoulder bumps, chest punches, head slaps, head grabs, low fives, high tens, full hugs, half hugs, team huddles. You get the point. The researchers discovered that teams whose players touch one another did a lot better than those whose teams uh, where the players didn't. And Keltner has concluded that touch lowers stress. It builds morale. It produces triumphs. A chest bump instructs us in cooperation. A half hug in compassion. Maybe that's a part of the reason why we may find our own stress levels rising in these pandemic times when we have to avoid any kind of physical contact. And if that is the kind of effect that human touch has, how much more so? then is it to experience the touch of Jesus, the spiritual embrace by God himself, the author and perfecter of our faith. What we need most in our lives is the touch of Jesus. The touch of Jesus brings healing. The touch of Jesus brings life. The touch of Jesus brings hope. The touch of Jesus brings joy. The touch of Jesus brings peace. The touch of Jesus brings brings love. Have you experienced this loving, life-giving touch? It's not enough to just be among the crowds that press in. It takes a touch to reach out in faith to Christ. This, co- this gift comes to us freely, but not cheaply. This gift is free, but not cheap. When I was little, I used to always go to my dad to buy me things. Invariably, he would always say, and who's going to pay for all this? He would buy it, but he would still ask it every time. And I would be like, uh, you would, duh. Someone always has to pay. The gift of God in Christ is free, but it's not cheap. In order to restore the woman And for that matter, in order to restore all of us back into community and to draw us back to himself, Christ was betrayed by his friends. Christ was cut off from his father. In order to bring Jairus' daughter back to life, in order to bring all of us back to life, to grant us life, Jesus had to die in our place. This gift of God in Christ is free, but it hasn't come cheaply. Let me ask you again. Have you experienced the touch of Jesus? If you have not, I invite you to give your life to the Lord, to turn and call on his name and experience that life-giving touch. Let us pray together. Our Father in heaven, we know that with a touch, our lives change. And so we pray that we would reach out to you in faith and experience the life-giving power of Jesus, the touch that heals, the touch that brings joy, the touch that brings peace and comfort, the touch that changes everything. Enable us, those of us who are in Christ, to rejoice in having this most important thing in our lives, the presence of God, Christ in us. We pray all these things in the victorious name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Covered by your grace.
greatest love of all is mine since you lay down your life the greatest sacrifice majesty found me just as I am, empty-handed but alive in your It's a privilege for us to be able to celebrate the Lord's Supper together, even as we are the church scattered, we are still the church. We are still the church. And today, through our celebration of the Lord's Supper, we proclaim the death of Christ. These elements, which are beside me, represent the body and blood of Christ. They are to us a, a visible sermon. They proclaim to us the great drama of redemption in Christ. The Apostle Paul, in writing about the Lord's Supper, says in 1 Corinthians 11, For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And in light of the seriousness of this invitation, Paul warns us or exhorts us in the very next verse, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. So before we take these elements, which symbolize both the sacrificial death of Christ in our place for our sins on the cross and the new life that comes to us through Christ, let's take a moment just to examine ourselves and if necessary to confess any sins that the Holy Spirit puts his thumb upon. 
and then to forsake or turn away from those sins. So just take, take a moment where you are to reflect, quiet your heart, and then we'll return to the elements. a sincere faith in Christ to join me in partaking of these elements. If you're not yet a believer in Christ or if in good conscience it would not be right for you to participate, I would simply encourage you to use this time to, to reflect on God's great love for us through his Son. And if you're not yet a believer in Christ, perhaps during these moments you will receive Christ into your life as your Lord and Savior. Pastor Aaron preached about the great love of God uh, for us through his son Jesus. And even now in these moments, if God has spoken to you, you can open your heart to him and invite Christ in. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, the bread we are about to partake of is symbolic of the human body in which you dwelt when you lived among us, living a sinless life for those 33 years. And when you were crucified, you bore our sins in your body on the cross that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By your wounds we are healed. You took our place, and you paid a price that we could never pay. Seal this to our hearts as we eat the bread, bread that is representative of your body, which is broken for us. Amen. Jesus took the bread and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. Let's pray for the cup. Lord Jesus, as we ponder partaking of the cup, our hearts resonate with the hymn writer who said this, This is all my hope and peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. After supper, Jesus took the cup and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's take the cup together. Our practice on the first Sunday of each month is to receive a special offering, an offering that is separate from our regular week-to-week -week giving. It's called the Benevolence Offering, also referred to as the Deacon's Offering. This separate offering is set aside, and we use it to meet the felt needs of those who are part of uh, this church family, and sometimes we use it to minister to people far from us but who are in great need. In your offering envelope booklet or on the app or even on the website, if you would like to contribute to this offering, this is above and beyond your regular giving, if you would like to do that, uh, then you can do that now. Uh, this offering will be used for those who are experiencing extraordinary need. And in this season of self-isolation through this pandemic, uh, there are greater numbers of people uh, experiencing this type of need. So if you would like to give to this offering, then, then you could do that now. You could do that now. Well, I do want to uh, welcome you to our service this morning. I would like to ask you just to look around the room where you're sitting right now, uh, those who are, who are with you, and I'd like you to just walk over to them, give them a holy hug, maybe a holy handshake. Just, just welcome those who are near to you this morning. I'm sure, the, I'm sure the teenagers are loving this very much. <laughs> uh, just a few announcements for you today. 
Uh, first, uh, Monday noon prayer. Monday noon prayer. Every Monday at noon, there is a half hour of drawing near to God in prayer. This is a, a Zoom meeting. So if you have time tomorrow from 12 to 1230, you are invited to, to join into that, that prayer gathering. You can simply join in and observe and pray quietly, or there will be opportunity for you to also pray. The link to that meeting is pinned into the comments. Grief Share. Uh, Grief Share is an online support group for those who are grieving the loss of a loved one. This group meets virtually every Thursday night from 7 to 9 p.m. Again, you could, you could jump into this on any Thursday night, and you're not com committing yourself to stay there every Thursday night. So if you would like to, to check this out, like to, to visit it, uh, Thursday nights uh, at 7 o'clock. Again, the link is in the comments. Story time. FBC story time. If you have a good story, and of course good is a relative term, but if you have a, a story of the Lord at work in your life and you would like to share that uh, with the church community as Tony and Melissa shared this morning. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, Tony, great haircut, by the way. Uh, then we would love to hear your story. And so please reach out to Pastor Aaron and he will include you into uh, the schedule. Our Ministry of Mercy, also known as MOM, uh, is doing wonderful things, actually amazing things. If you or someone you know from the First Baptist Church family is in need of groceries, but they're not able to go out, they're not able to get out for, for one reason or another, well, then as we like to say, uh, send MOM to the store for you. Simply contact Maria Chung. Uh, her contact information is pinned into the comments and uh, she'll uh, tell you everything that you need to know about this ministry. Maria, thank you so much. M uh, Maria is our Minister of Congregational Life. We're just so thankful that God has uh, not only brought her to First Baptist Church, but brought her even for such a time as this, such a time as this. She's really like our Queen Esther. Uh, Mother's Day video. Next week is Mother's Day, and we are making a church-wide video appreciating our moms. And when I say we, I mean somebody else, but we're doing it here at the church. And if you would like to express your appreciation for your mother, then you can, you can create a short video. Now, the video has to be 15 words or less in the language of your choice, not 16 words, not 18 words, not 15 hyphenated words, but but 15 words or less, then you can make that video and then you, you can upload it by clicking on the link in the pinned comment. And here's, a, here's just a professional tip. Uh, do this, if you're using your phone, do this in landscape mode. Turn your camera sideways and the video will come out uh, much better. Uh, finally, part two of Lauren Moy's job search webinar will be held this Saturday, May 9th at 10 a.m. The link to that is also pinned in the comments. Now is the time in our service where we receive our tithes and offerings. Uh, if you're a, a part of First Baptist Church, either a member or a regular attendee, uh, this is a time when we receive our, our offerings. Uh, there are three ways that you can share your offerings uh, with the church. You could use the church app, you can use the church website, or you can simply mail it in. And again, if you look in the comments, you'll see the different links uh, to do that. The Holy Spirit says to us through the pen of the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, each one should give what they have decided in their heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much that even in these days of separation, we can still gather together uh, through this, through this uh, mechanism. Uh, we can gather, we can worship together, we can interact together. We can hear a word from you. We can praise your name. Father, we thank you for all that you've done for us, all that you've given to us. And ultimately, we thank you for the indescribable gift of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who paid a price for our sins that we could never pay. Father, as we continue in worship now, we, we give to you just a small portion, a token of all that you've given to us. We give this to you, asking that you would bless it and use it for the work of your kingdom. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now let's receive our benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God 
and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. God bless you.